really how this all came about is can be blamed on my mother. She was a, a biologist and uh, she instilled in me a whole reverence for nature. I, I'm probably not much different than, than most kids that, that see birds and because I think since man began, we've been envious of birds, the three-dimensional freedom, the, the whole uh, wonder of flight. So when hang gliding came along, of course, you didn't need a license. You just had to be have enough nerve to run off a hill with one of these things. And, and so I survived the, the hang gliding, and then that evolved into ultralight flying and, and uh, became really one of the Canadian pioneers in ultralight aviation, you might say, but just, just because I had this desire to get up there and fly. But then one day uh, in the fall, I had an amazing experience. There was a, a, a stubble field just black with birds, and I thought they were starlings or something like that. Throttle back, as I got down, the whole field rose up, and all of a sudden I was in this huge flock of ducks. And here I was in this stream of birds, and it was just absolutely amazing. They couldn't outclimb me, and I couldn't outclimb them. And uh, here we were cruising across the countryside, and, and it was in this river of birds. And, and, and all it just took me into a new time and space. It was like I'd been there. Uh, for a million years, and, and it was such a, a, a phenomenal experience, I had to try and repeat it, and because uh, I had to try and find some way of sharing that vision with other people. So I, I met a guy by the name of Bill Carrick, who had uh, got birds to follow a boat. Uh, he, he provided me with some goslings and, and, and uh, taught me about uh, Conrad Lorenz, who wrote the book on how birds learn things. And from that, I learned about imprinting and got those young geese to follow the, the uh, aircraft. And it took me three years to figure out exactly how to do it. But uh, to make a long story short, in, in 1988, I got 12 geese that would fly with me. And it was just everything I thought it would be. And it just so happened it was the first time that uh, you could get a little SVHS handheld video camera. And I acquired one of those, made a little documentary of it. It had the image of the birds from their point of view and, and you saw the, you saw those birds flying right next to you and it, and that caught so many people's imagination well bill and i had been friends and acquaintances for a long time i mean he's an artist and i'm a photographer and i helped him with it a little bit in his handheld video camera and i acquired one of those made a little documentary of it it had the image of the birds from their point of view and, and you saw the, you saw those birds flying right next to you, and, it, and that caught so many people's imagination. Well, Bill and I had been friends and acquaintances for a long time. I mean, he's an artist, and I'm a photographer, and I helped him with it a little bit in his work. I'd photograph a few things for him, and basically our, our, our partnership or our friendship is, is, is revolved around flying. We were both ultralight pilots and, and, and had interest in the same kind of thing. Uh, I think to some degree, Bill and I are similar. We're, you know, we're half scientific and we're half creative and we're kind of torn between the middle, you know, we don't know which side of our brain is working the best, but anyway, it, 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 it's a, um, a kind of a camaraderie there. And we've been friends for a long time. Joe at that time joined up with me and, and the two of us flew a flock of Canada geese to Virginia and in the, the following spring they returned, much to everybody's amazement, mine included. I mean, it was absolutely phenomenal. That really garnered the interest of the scientific community and that really caught their attention as well as, as, as the, uh, the public uh, interest. There was a lot of uh, interest in making a film of, of that whole idea. So, of course, the uh, Columbia Pictures uh, um, made Fly Away Home, and, and uh, uh, it really gave a picture of, you know, it, was a, it, it wasn't the, the absolute true story by any means, but there were little bits and pieces of it. I had seen the piece on 2020, so I knew about the geese flying with the ultralights. And, um, you know, so I knew that aspect of it. But then, you know, anytime you take anything real and you make it dramatic, you have to find a seamless way of introducing a dramatic story to, the, to something that's basically realistic. Well, the further we went with it, the more, you know, I tried to take his real story and make the movie about that. And the fact that we were meeting him on his farm was also a factor because he has all these amazing sculptures he's created. He has all these airplanes and hangars, these little ultralights that all are various designs. He has this incredible underground house that he invented and designed and everything. 
it's it's like going to see you know some space guy on Mars or something. I mean, it's unbelievable what an incredible place this was. Well, so we talked and he talked about stuff that he was interested in and uh, what he was interested in in terms of the geese and everything. He said, well, today, you know, the uh, I'm expecting the geese to come in, you know, and we're sitting there, and all of a sudden we hear this noise and look up. There's like 25 geese are circling around, and they land right there in front of us. And those are the geese that he flew down there. I mean, hey, did he arrange that? I mean, I mean, obviously something was happening here. Fly Away Home did two good things. It provided us with enough capital to carry on a number of studies. And the other thing it is, it raised the awareness of people right around the world about the, the plight of endangered birds. And when we land, we say, did you see the film Fly Away Home? And it gives them the image to start with, and then you can, you can elaborate on it. In Fly Away Home, I mean, the basic reason for the geese to go south was just for the, that particular flock of geese, but it was, it was to save a wetland. And this is not, Operation Migration is not about saving a wetland. This is about saving a species. I mean. Uh, he subsequently did five or six other migrations with geese to uh, refine the technique. And then they got into uh, sandhill cranes, which is uh, a cousin to the whooping crane. Um, very similar, but abundant. There are thousands of sandhill cranes. They were readily available species to see if the technique would work. Um, the goal all along has been the whooping crane. It's, it's the icon of endangered species, if you will, in North America. I don't know if you're aware, but the whooping crane, you know, back in the 1940s, there were only 15 birds. All the birds we have today are descendants of 15 birds. When you realize there are only a couple of hundred of them, um, you suddenly start to think that, you know, it's very fragile. And, and where they winter along the Texas coast, uh, a hurricane or something could wipe the whole flock out. That's why it's in important to get a second migratory flock happening. So the whooping crane recovery team, uh, the, the Canada-US team, joint team that's responsible for these birds, um, started a, a, a non-migratory population in Florida. They raised birds in captivity, released them in Florida, and those birds were never shown a migration route by parents, so they became resident, and they stay in Florida. And uh, we want to start a, a third population, migratory, migrating from uh, Wisconsin down to Florida, and once we do that, we'll have three discrete populations, and then the bird hopefully can be down next year. And cranes are quite a different species, so we had to learn a whole lot of new things to get cranes to follow us. And, and uh, we had to, we, we did one study after another. And the other thing was that we had, we couldn't fly with them like we could fly with geese and, and not, uh, uh, we had to keep the cranes wild. So there's a, there was a tremendous amount of work in, in learning how to uh, wear costumes and, and how to, use the appropriate sounds, how to raise the cranes, how to fly with them differently. The whole thing was uh, was a whole new learning experience, and, and we had to go through the R&D, if you will, of cranes. When they leave the nest, they, they pay attention to the first thing that really looks after them and nurtures them, and, and they imprint on that, normally their parent. So that's how the whole process works. We just substitute parent for pilot, and the birds imprint on us. Ideally, if we were gonna raise these birds to fly with us, we would morph into a, an exact replica of a bird <laughs> and fly with it. That's impossible. We have to stay in human form. So we have to mask that human form. And, and the reason for that is uh, when these birds get to uh, adult age, they're, they're quite uh, um, territorial. Uh, if, if they become imprinted on humans, consider humans as part of their species, uh, that, then that interaction between the humans and, the, and the, bird, the adult birds is not a good thing. We raise, costume raise the cranes so that they don't recognize their human form. We don't talk in front of them. We don't make wild gestures with their hands. We keep everything very low key as far as any human activity. And we stay away from them as much as possible. The only contact that even the costume has is just feeding and training exercises, getting them to follow the ultralight. We're trying to, to develop a technique where we can take a bird from the wild, have as little impact as possible on it, keep it as wild as possible, not introduce it to anything human, and get it south. So, so it's still a wild bird. It reverts to the wild, it avoids people, it is what it's supposed to be, except it has this vague memory of a migration and some indication of how to get back to where they started. That's what we're trying to do, has that a little impact as possible on these birds. Part of the spin-off of doing these migrations, part of the joy of this migration, 
are the people you meet because it's traveling across America on a different uh, element entirely. You're going like the birds go and you land in people's backyards that, that are removed from urban areas. So you, so you meet a cross-section of America that n no one really knows and it's, and it's quite wonderful. Just about every night we get invited for dinner. I mean, that's a big undertaking to take that, you know, to, to entertain people all day, give them everything they need, and then invite them to dinner at the same time. It's, it's a huge undertaking, but we have some fabulous apple pie. And it's, it's, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> the response we've had is just, just amazing. The team is really uh, an excellent team, um, you know, starting with Joe. Joe is a, a man who's, who's dedicated and attention to detail, has tremendous passion for the whole thing. You know, on one hand, um, we've got Bill, who's not only dyslexic but colorblind and sort of all over the place, not an organized moment in the man's life, but, you know, we love him dearly. And on the other hand, you've got Joe, who is super organized, very focused to detail, has to have things just done a certain way. So I guess, you know, the, the funny part is trying to find the medium. And Heather Ray uh, joined us uh, about three years ago and, and uh, has just worked doggedly at, at uh, keeping things going and, and, uh, uh, and, and looking after all of the administrative things that are just such a headache to me and Joe. She's one of those people that spends her weekends thinking about what she can do to make it better and how we can fundraise here and how we can fix the website there. She's one of those people that's involved, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's in her mind. And, and that you can't, you know, you can't hire that. That's, that's not an employee. That's a team member. Okay, and Richard, it's uh, Paula. Yep. Yeah, they say they're going to be at uh, Cherry Hill at 8 o'clock, and they figure that'll be their destination. Okay, thanks very much. Richard Van Hoovelen, who's a, a multi-talented guy, has worked with me for 23 years, loves the whole thing and has a passion for it too, uh, and, and uh, can, can uh, fill in anywhere, do anything from flying the aircraft to, to, to fixing a, a, a flat tire, uh, you know, anything. I'm sort of more behind the scenes making sure things get done and uh, let them bask in their glory, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> he sort of runs the ground crew and makes sure the pens are up, the, the trikes are flying fine, and you know, all of those are sort of his responsibilities. And now with the migrations, now I've been trained how to fly the ultralights as well. So I'm also a backup pilot for uh, all these guys. Don and Paula are saints. They're just wonderful people. Instead of being uh, part of the ground crew, Don had decided really uh, with the others it would be helpful if there was an aircraft flying above the trikes. They were having problems with communications and as a communication relay, the airborne aircraft up higher would have much more range and be able to keep contact with the ground crews and, and help to keep everyone informed as to what was happening because things didn't always go as planned. Yeah, there has to be some sort of a, a lifeline um, simply because they're up there flying, you never know what's going to happen. Um, they could go down, they could lose radio contact. So as soon as they're on the ground, I need to know. We have charts and radios and, and communications um, abilities by being above that we can uh, draw on, on help for them. And also the fact we're in an enclosed cockpit. Yeah. We can have the maps, we can yeah. have the, the um, manuals and everything handy. In the trikes, they can't do that. They're open, they can throw the open map up, it's going to be gone. It's like any safety net, you know, hopefully you never use it. It just sits there doing nothing, but, but there are times when, when they save the whole show. Bill and Joe have a way of, you know, getting people involved in the project because it is very magical. You stand in awe of, of birds no matter what, and it's wonderful to be up there with them and be able to reach out and, and have their wings brush your fingertips and, 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 uh, and see them. Uh, th their characters, their individuals, they play with the aircraft when they're learning. Uh, th there's so much uh, joy out of flying with birds that it's, it's, it becomes very addictive. It's quiet and, and you go for a walk in the trees. You know, the trees are just 20 feet below you. That's a nice way to fly. It's just spectacular. It's really, people just go nuts over it. Waking up in, in the middle of the night, sort of, and, and driving out to their locations and, and uh, watching it all unfold and everybody's quietly doing their jobs and setting up and, and you know, it just sort of builds and the sun starts coming up and suddenly, you know, there's, there's three trikes taking off and then finally, you know, Joe and the birds, you know, come out of the mists of time and, and uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing to see. I, I, I don't think I can express it in words.
there are so many emotions all tied up into it, and, and, and any any one can come at the come to the surface at any point you know, while you're doing this. I mean, you know, naturally we're we're flying low level usually in, in, in the early morning, and so there's there's a degree of danger in that. You know, that that's to be considered anyway. You got to pay attention to what you're doing. Nine times out of ten, the birds obviously fly behind the wing, and it's a delta wing type aircraft, so the tip is is aft of where you are, and, and so you end up with one hand on the control bar and turned around backwards in the seat, you know, looking over your shoulder at these birds. And I've oop, there's a there's a silo, there's a tree, I didn't see that one, you know. So you get that aspect of it happening, you know, because you're always looking backwards. It's incredible. <laughs> it's really an incredible experience to fly with them. Um, it's, it's something you can't really describe, and it's something you have to experience. As they get used to the whole concept of migration, of going from one place to the next, there's a, there's a, there's a, a mental attitude that takes over the birds. You can see it, and they become dedicated, and they pay attention to the aircraft, and they lock onto it, and they, they, just, they get down to the business of covering ground. And we were flying over um, Indiana, 2,500 feet, on a perfect day with a 20-mile-an-hour tailwind. So I, I raised the RPM of the aircraft by about maybe 50 RPM, bumped it up to around 42 miles an hour. And, and the birds just kind of locked in. It was their speed and their cadence. And, and the lead bird was that far from the wingtip, and he just locked in and, and opened his wings and, and just sat there. And the next bird fall in, fell in behind him, and we had this string of pearls off the wingtip that lasted for maybe 30 minutes. It was just a, an amazing thing to do, you know. And then you realize that... that these birds have been doing this, the same migration, the same traditional route for nine million years. It's about giving, giving something back. And if, if, they can, if they can pull this off, I mean, from something that started as sort of a, you know, a, a, a flying sculptor to actually put the footing down to save an endangered species, it's quite a remarkable achievement. You know, a lot of recovery efforts and, and dollars are spent on, on, on species, and it's just a catalog what's you know, what's happening to them, why they're declining, or, or what's wrong with their habitat. There, there's millions of dollars spent just in that research, and this research is actually replacing the species. This is not seeing what's wrong or seeing, seeing if we can identify the problem. This is actually putting back. You know, this is one that's reached a level now where we're ready to start reintroducing the birds, and, and it's an important study, and, and, if, and if, we can, if we can fund it, we can do it, and we can save a species. When, when it comes to the overall project, yeah, I, you know, I, I wake up in the morning and really feel good about uh, about how things have progressed you know from very simple beginnings to to well this last migration was absolutely wonderful and it was such a great success and it took a real team effort and having everybody working together and enjoying it while they're doing it and then seeing that the birds got there and, and that we're one step closer to to uh, saving the whooping crane the whole thing is quite wonderful and I do I do feel great about it uh, and, but you can't stop there